I'm Guy McLean. I'm the director here at the Westfield Athenaeum, and we're preparing for a, a brand new show that's going to open uh, in May. And we're really excited to be in the studio of Marie Crane Yvonne. So um, this is really exciting. I always love to, to visit a studio and see what artists are working on. And I see you've got an interesting project right here that you're working on today. Can you tell us something about that, this? Definitely. This is part of my Into the Sea collection. I started working on this collection in the last few years. You have an evolution of the way I like to work with light. Um, one of the things I've been challenging myself with, and it's first I started at the top of the water and I really wanted to show the reflection and that gorgeous feeling of being on the water. And then I started to feel like, well, let's take that light down inside and see what we can do. Ah, very interesting. Yeah. And so these are, these are some of examples of, uh, of this series and what you're working on right now? Yeah, so these I started working on a nice rolled paper canvas and I started to work, like I said, those layers and those transparencies. Um, and now, right now, I'm actually working on quite a big one. Um, do you want me to lift it up? Yeah, let's lift it uh, up. Let's and show it off. Let you out, because let's see, because here's a work in progress here. So tell us about how, how this uh, evolved uh, and where you are, what stage you are in at this point with, with the painting. Okay. Well, as you know, I love to play. Yes. So I'm going to say this started portrait. It was high and I had a landscape growing across. Yes. And then I started to really love the texture. So I laid it down and I started to pull from it. Yes. I always say there's probably a hundred different paintings under every painting. <laughs> yes. But it was the texture that started to pull me in. And then I started to play with the contrast. I really, really um, choice about pulling the lights from the darks and then really paying attention to the color theory behind that. Yeah, yeah. Where, you know, where we have these beautiful little spots of ochre and rust by contrast to the luminous quality of the blues and the aquamarine and the turquoise, they yeah. they want to play well with each other. Yes, and, and this may not be visible in the camera, but boy, I love that it has a little bit of texture in it, you know. It's not a flat surface, uh, and the texture really adds a quality to it. I see little rough places and, you know, uh, various places. Uh, how do you use texture in, uh, when you're working? I go between the two. There's times when I'm pushing flat, but when I start moving into texture, I try to use it actually as a playing field for highlights and low lights, where it's a, for me, I love nothing more than to swipe with a contrasting light to pull that contrast forward. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing that paintings, that you can do with a painting that you can't do with, say, a photograph or something. Exactly. It, and texture adds something that's, that totally. gives, it, it gives more depth to the painting, adds a, a, a layer, a dimension to it right. that a flat surface wouldn't have. That's what I find very interesting. Artists who use texture, I think that those, to me, are much more interesting paintings. Right. But also, too, another thing about this that I'm seeing develop here is wonderful atmosphere. Um, even though, you know, there's a lot of brush strokes going back in different areas, there's depth in this painting. You feel like you're looking into some sort of atmospheric depth, and I love that quality. Uh, are, you, are you trying to create kind of an atmospheric effect in your paintings? Absolutely, always. I, you know, when you asked me about um, texture, you know, there's times I'm really, I'm really thinking it through. Mm -hmm. And there's times I'm really loose and playful, but in the building phase, when I did start to really like dive into the texture, I'm literally thinking of what a stone looks like. I'm literally thinking of the speckles on a beautiful piece of granite that when you're looking down through the water. So I do, I love texture and I love that you can build texture in that way but I always, always want it to feel atmospheric and softer than that. Yes, there's a, there's a, a kind of a tension or a push and pull back yeah. between the surface of the canvas, which has texture and this sort of thing, and the sense of looking into something right. deep and atmospheric. I love that quality. And I just love the colors too, you know, the blending of the colors. Uh, that's very interesting too. And it's, th this evokes for me 
you know, if we look back in the history of art and going back into the mid 20th century, uh, the color field painters, Helen Frankenthal or Morris Lewis, uh, do you feel that those are influences on your work? Absolutely, yes. Um, you know, when we look, when we look back toward those early abstract artists, they were really playing with paint. They were yes. really allowing the paint to do the work and then constantly having conversations with the materials like if you can do this, what can you do? What can you do next? If you want to pour, once you pour, what can I do with you there? Can I scratch into your surface? Can I, can I pour it? There are so many ways we can manipulate the materials and so many ways that the materials can play together. Yes, yes. Yeah. We, and, you know, speaking of pour, you know, Helen Frankenthal, of course, is well known for the, for the artist who yes. developed the pour technique where she yes. would let, uh, uh, you know, paint pour. Yep. Do you use pour techniques? Or I definitely do. You do. Yeah. That's very interesting. Because one, one of the things she, well, she's known for is she had gone to um, Jackson Pollock's studio. Yes. Completely appreciated what he was doing and he was using things like I'm using like house paint and it, he would throw it all at the canvas we all know Jackson Pollock when yeah, we the see it. The drip technique yep. dripping the paint yes. And she went to his studio and you know something woke in her and she went back to her own studio thinned it out and started pouring it onto raw canvas and there's something so beautiful about that and when I paint thin I'm constantly trying to play with that raw canvas that's saturated with pigment because it's it's gorgeous and when you see the weave of the canvas it's just so so beautiful i love that so much yes yes it's so interesting jackson pollock you know this great innovator in terms of coming up with this drip technique it seems like a lot of ideas came out of that and a lot of possibilities yeah. Frankenthaler's poor technique, yeah. uh, uh, artists like Gerhard Richter in his using squeegees. Yes. Uh, he, he opened up so many possibilities, and it seems to me that you've really, uh, you know, found ways of working with those techniques yeah. uh, that are ve that have, are producing very interesting results. Yeah. When I was first decorative painting, um, my partner went to a, a phenomenal school in New York, and we we came home with these techniques that were just they were, you know, we had a binder and we could follow the rules and my girlfriend Gina, she was a rule follower and I'd say, oh, but can we take that one and mix that one with together? And yes. so if we were creating faux stone or if we were creating a uh, collar wash, again back to Helen Frankenthaler, yes. like when those move together, it's like little magic moments happen. So, yeah, so, well, this is fascinating. It's, it, it's so interesting to see uh, a work in progress here. But let's move on to some of the other paintings you have in the studio because I want right. to explore some of these other works. So let's set this okay. down. So um, these, uh, these paintings here are intriguing to me, how you've used these kind of very jagged linear lines to evoke trees, but also some very interesting use of atmosphere. And also, too, the same kind of technique right here. Can you tell us about how, uh, kind of what, uh, uh, how these works evolved and what, and what the expressive, uh, what, what expression you're looking for with these works? Mm -hmm. uh, so, I've been paint. I've been in the tree series for such a long time, probably about 15 years. Wow! And I was working really linear, as we can see back here. But I started to, over the last year, um, really push myself to creating more of an organic with the branches, lines crossing. I close my eyes, and I sometimes I already see a painting, and I'm pushing, pushing myself to actually create it. Yes. So in my mind's eye, I have something that's highly textured and the branches are glowing and you can feel that little, uh, that aura from the branch to branch and that gorgeous space of negative light behind it shining back through. Yes. So that's all in my heart and in my mind. And then I'm kind of like, okay, how many layers? How would I get there? What do I do? So on this one, Oh, I, I could probably show you a hundred paintings before this one Yes. Um, that were practice, just lots and lots of practice. And as I started to be able to move 
that branch and I was doing it with some blowing techniques and some pouring and really manipulating. Uh, when I started to really appreciate that technique, I started to really play with it. So this felt like atmospherically and um, in composition especially, it felt like, oh, okay, I'm really, I felt really happy with it, which is always my judge. Yes. So then when I moved into this one, I was really appreciating the background. Of course, we almost started this way, but I can never stop playing. I can never stop playing. So I love to work with stains and put like a beautiful sheer wash over something. And I'm seeing kind of some stain effects right in this area, exactly. right? Exactly. Some of these areas right here. So if I, when I pull the stain across, because in, in my opinion, there's nothing more gorgeous than patina. Yes. I love something that's aged and you can feel that, that like texture and the depth and you get a little peekaboo behind of a true, a color. It's like, yeah. I love antiquing. Right, right. So that's right. where- And this painting has some of that quality, doesn't exactly, it? Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, off, these are really bright behind, but when you put like a Van Dyke brown or a beautiful dark, like a, a rich Van Dyke chestnut, it just lays so beautifully and you get that peekaboo effect. Yes, and of course, the, the title of this exhibit is, you know, uh, uh, we're evoking, you know, the, the difference between light and dark, yeah. shadow, you know, light and shadow yeah. and this sort of thing. And I think this painting is a great example of this. It, it seems like a very kind of, a kind of maybe a, a sunset scene at dusk or something. It yeah. evokes that kind of quality. I think it's just so effective. Thank but you. But uh, apart from the what it shows, uh, it's so interesting to look at the technique of how you've laid this kind of uh, atmospheric quality down with the staining, and then it seems like uh, the the branches and the trees went above that. W w were the trees kind of like the last stage? So you did a layer, uh, you know, you oh, did gosh. an atmosphere, yep. and then the trees went above that. Is that is that the way that it, uh, the, the painting evolved, it, or or did it go? Did it work? together it's it's a constant back and forth back and forth okay it's a, that's it's a constant back and forth where the layers are sometimes happening really quickly yes sometimes if I start to dislike it yes I'll take everything and scrape it back uh -huh. and then with stain you can be left with what you started with so oftentimes the original DNA of the painting yes is what is the highlight at the end of the painting Aha. Uh -huh. It's uh -huh. like, yeah, that's... <laughs> that, that becomes something that is, is one of the most interesting aspects of the painting is Absolutely. something you scraped away and left yes. from the beginning of the painting, yes. from the beginning of the painting. That's I, interesting. I had an instructor once call them the dinosaur footprints of the painting. The di oh, that's interesting. Yeah. The dinosaur footprints. That makes yep. sense. So I'm probably like everybody else right now, we were talking about poor paintings, yes. original poor paintings, right. but there is a trend now with poor paintings. Yes, and yes. And it kind of really makes art accessible. Right. And magic really does happen when paint is poured. Yes, yes. So, and you have to water it down a little bit more to pour it, isn't that correct? It's like uh, the typical painting that you know, the typical paint that's in a tube or something would not work in a, for a poor yeah. painting. Is that correct? I think so. Yeah. So I haven't looked up like the exact um, recipe for at, for poor painting that we're seeing. Like, let's say we go to Michaels and pick up a kit. Yes. I never really went and found those. Yes. But I love stains and I love watercolor and uh, so I'm like always like. Again, like I'm always like kind of making, trying to make my own recipe. Yes. I'm like improviser. Right, right. So these, along with the one we were originally talking about, I'm starting with a surface texture and yes. then I'm really trying to force the pour. Aha. Uh -huh. So I started to, I really wanted to create 
in this one I had a thought ahead of time. I really wanted to create the feeling of being way, way up high and looking down toward the water where the coastline comes in. The, where the waves are kind of flowing yeah. into the coast. You could see the sand underneath. And we had just taken yes, an amazing yes. family vacation. And, and you really get a sense of that from this, don't you? Yeah. But it, but it, it's, it's a pour that created this. Yeah. And you couldn't do that. You couldn't paint this with a paintbrush and get Never. anything near. Never. Yeah. Never. You really need the pour technique to create this kind of effect. You have to allow the magic of the paint to do its job. Yes. And then it's almost like you're like the, uh, what would you call it? Like the, like maestro. Yes. It, in a sense, like you're right. directing the paint. So yes. it's like I am lifting it and just really trying to make it happen. One of the things I use all the time that's so cool and really changed my work, I use an infrared heating lamp. Yes. And I can take a moment where I'm super satisfied and I'm like, oh, I love you. Yeah, this is good. And instead of either, um, I hate to say this, but murdering it by taking it too far, yes. I can take that step and I can arrest it. And I can put it under the lamp and I can take a pause, take a breath, and allow that layer to set up, just as if I'd walked away for two or three days, let it dry and came back. I can work really quickly now because that drying is happening immediately. Aha, uh -huh. so, so, and that allows you to do multiple layers yeah. and build up a surface exactly. that has a certain effect. Exactly. Uh, because if you didn't use the heat lamp, it would, go much, it would go much slower. Much slower and you lose that spontaneous joy. Yes. Where I think that's where, um, I keep saying where the magic happens. Right. But it really is, there are moments that you can like, like just you not even on purpose it's like god's hand kind of comes in and marries the paint and the texture in a way that is just so beautiful right right and i just love this one just is you know because you have these wonderful kind of emerald greens here evolving down into the blues here i just think this is a wonderful painting and it's so interesting to hear how this came into into existence on the pouring you know actually lifting the painting or kind of pushing certain areas, yeah. uh, pushing the paint in certain yeah. kind of ways. And there's times like, you know, when I started to pull in the white, I allowed that flow to happen, but then I'll take the tiniest artist's brush yes. with a little bit of like, you know, a little bit of acrylic and go in and really work the little details because I want your eye to move to certain spots to allow for composition. Right, right, right. And, uh, you know, I think many people think that uh, compositions like this are just kind of allowed to be what they are. But actually, there's a lot of, th I, I can tell there's a lot of thought yeah. in this. One of the tricks that, you know, I know you're very familiar with that artists use is diagonals. A diagonal is, an, is a line, uh, you know, that, se that seems, you know, it's not as static. Right. Uh, there's movement, diagonals right. uh, create movement in a painting. And you very purposely, I can see, created a diagonal here, right. which gives movement to the painting. It's a little trick that right. artists use. And so I think, that, I think that's important for people uh, who maybe are, new, uh, you, know, you know, new to the idea of improvised paintings using right. pour techniques, drip techniques, right. things like that, that still there's a lot of composition, a lot of thought that goes into the creation of a painting like this. And I can see just this one element, the diagonal, yeah. that you can see in artists from the past. And, and yeah. so I think that's very, uh, you know, so, um, so which raises a question, uh, when you are looking at a blank canvas, that's always <laughs> kind of a scary thing for an artist. I know, you know, yeah. he'll blank, now, now what do I do? Now what do um, I do? How much do you think about uh, the composition ahead of time on what, you know, what you want the final product to be? Uh, do you have a, you know, a real roadmap to that? Or, or is it pretty definite in your mind? Or is it yeah. fairly open? It's always open with me. Always it's open. It's always open, but I, composition is something that I don't want to say I struggle with because I understand, uh, you know, I was a, a trained fine artist. I have an academic approach. Yes. But there are times that I allow my spontaneity to take over my academic mind. And at one point I thought, I've been forgetting about composition. 
like ah, I was so into it that I was forgetting about composition. So I go back and I study the golden ratio and I really start paying attention. I go back again to that training. Yes. And then I will start start in a way a lot of times when I start it's very loose and organic and I'm just getting the paint down because I like to build that first layer sure if I see some opportunities happening where I see my light source and I see where my dark is or I've concocted a line that oh boy I didn't mean that but it really works yes I then can start to move into it so some are some of my paintings are very they start really playfully others I think and think and think and I practice 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 to try to get there yes so there's so there's kind of a foundation of you know based on your training your knowledge of, of previous art styles but then when you get into the painting you follow the lead of the painting so to speak I do would you say yeah I do I I'm always going back and back forth. and forth I've had to I had to order a timer on Amazon yes. to actually set the, and that didn't last long, but yes. I was setting the timer to come out of myself, like to like, okay, wake yes. up, pay attention to what's happening here. Yes. I'll bet, I'll bet you're one of those artists. I've talked to other artists who says, who say, you know, in creating a painting, you know, people will, always are asking how long it takes to make a painting. And in, you know, in, uh, you know, I've talked to so many artists who say, well, are you counting the time that I'm actually doing something to the right. canvas or right. the time I'm looking at it, trying to figure out what I want to right. do? I think you go into that category, isn't oh, that true? Oh my gosh. I say it's either it's a third, this painting took me 30 years or this painting took me 24 hours yes, right? I yes. just when I do actually come to the canvas I consider it an incredible gift to have that time and I tend to when I feel a painting especially brewing I have to gear up like an athlete in a way yes I have to um, drink a lot of water before I start because I will literally paint for eight hours without taking a break which is it's my family knows it there was one time there was smoke detector going off in our house my studio was at home and my husband's begging me to come upstairs and I'm like I got it I got it because I know his voice and I knew like what real concern <laughs> would sound like yes but I'm like to me the painting is it's just everything I love it so much I can't leave it Yes. Yeah, you get so wrapped up uh, in the process. The best. That it's yes, the creative process kicks in and it's a yeah. it's wonderful. My absolute favorite thing to do. Yes. Well, this has been so interesting. I'm looking forward so much to the exhibit. Oh, I, it's, I think it's going to be a great exhibit. The fact that it's going to be in the Athenaeum as well as in the Renova building, I think it's very exciting. Uh, I'm very much looking forward oh, to the same. exhibit. Uh, thank you. It's an incredible opportunity. And the dual gallery experience, I, I feel like I've waited my whole life for something like this. And with both galleries, I'm going to be able to show um, at the Athenaeum is such a classic, gorgeous space. Yes. That, that is really the gallery experience of an artist's dreams. And then the Creative Arts Center can really kind of highlight some of the behind the scenes that I've been working toward with my decorative art background. I'm going to have some things there to show like what I've been up to all these years. That's great. And I think it's going to be great for the community, for the Westfield yeah. community. They're Definitely. going to have a chance to see a really big show so they can really see how an artist works in a variety of ways, yeah. working with a couple of themes, yeah. but expanding and, and creating a series yeah. of works. So I think it's a real opportunity for the community as well to see, to see a, a body of work. Yeah. So I'm very very excited. This is going to be a great show. Thank you. Well, Marie, this has been so fascinating, uh, having a chance to see your studio, uh, have a chance to talk to you about art. Um, so tell us uh, uh, about what you see uh, with this exhibit and what this exhibit means to you. Oh my gosh. I am being from Westfield. It's an incredible opportunity could really choke me up. Uh -huh. um, it's an incredible opportunity to show my work to the people I know and love. Yes, because I think that's one thing that's going to be very wonderful about this exhibit is 
um, because we're, it's going to be in two locations, yeah. there's going to be a chance for people to see such a variety of your work. And that is really, that's a great opportunity. I think it's also a great opportunity for the residents of Westfield to see how an artist works. Yeah. The, the, the complete range and scope of their work. Yeah. Uh, so, and I think, you know, it, it's, the, the exhibit's going to run from the beginning of May yep. uh, through the end of July, yes. uh, which, is great, it, which is great too. People will have a chance to come back to visit again because yeah. one of the best things about an exhibit is being able to come back and see, see it uh, two or three times just yeah. to uh, really get a sense of what the work is about. So yeah. I think this is going to be really, really special. Thank you. Really impor uh, an important a uh, contribution to the culture of Westfield. Yeah, definitely. A, a dual gallery experience, I mean, it's a dream, it's, it is really a dream come true. And I said, with the Athenaeum itself being such a gorgeous, classic gallery, it's a beautiful, beautiful space. And yeah. I know, thank you so much for the opportunity because you've done an amazing job bringing artists to Westfield and really highlighting what's really happening in Westfield. We have so much creativity. This actually launches a really creative weekend for Westfield. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah we're gonna have a lot of art activities uh, with, with the opening weekend. Uh, so I, yeah, I'm really excited about it. I, I think this is, this is the kind of exhibit that will give, uh, will bring a cultural presence to Westfield yeah. that we really haven't seen in the past. And hopefully at the beginning of many, many more like it. Absolutely, thank you so much. Thank you.